You're listening to The Peach Pit. I'm here with none other than Bird Problems from Montreal, Quebec, and also Toronto for right now. And they're here to talk to me about all their music and everything like that. Guys, thank you so much for getting back to me. You're welcome. Sure thing. Thanks for having us. Great. And so now I just realized, too, that maybe we should get everybody kind of familiar with your guys' voices. So I'll just play this at the beginning. If you guys would want to say your name, what you play in the band, and so, so I can people will know, match your voices to who you are. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm Joseph. I uh, play guitar in Bird Problems. I, I'm Michael. I'm the vocalist for Bird Problems. I'm Daniel. I play drums. So I like to start with kind of like origin stories. So I just kind of got to get some background on all you guys. Just like, how do you remember falling in love with music? And how do you guys remember like getting together and getting the band started? Uh, I guess I'll, I'll start. Um, so Michael and I are brothers. Um, so we started, you know, basically my entire music taste was shaped uh, by him uh, when I was like, very young, 10, 11, 12, he was showing me, you know, early, heavier music, you know, that wasn't in the, in the top 40. Um, you know, Linkin Park, Green Day, all these, you know, bands that ended up shaping my, my taste, sort of. And then as I got older and, and started exploring a little more, uh, more metal on my own, got super into metalcore, uh, which, which helped me a lot. It kind of helped my taste a lot. And, uh, just kind of went from there. So yeah, Michael and I were playing together from a pretty young age. And, you know, I was right when I got the drum kit, you know, he already played guitar and, and did some vocals. So we were jamming on like a day to remember songs and Lincoln park songs in our basement at, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old. Um, that's really how, uh, we started, uh, playing together. Me and me and me and Michael. All right. And so then starting bird problems, how did that all begin? Joseph, do you remember how we, uh, how we found you? Oh yeah. Well, we, we all went to high school together. I'm a, a bit younger than Michael and Daniel, although Michael's a few years older than me. So um, me and Daniel started jamming uh, pretty consistently, like during the lunch times in high school. And then uh, he approached me uh one day he was like oh like i'm trying to start this band with uh, my brother do you want to play guitar in it and uh he showed me a really uh unflattering demo on a, on his phone and uh, and i was like oh this is sick <laughs> and uh, the rest is history i guess <laughs> and so what's some of your background like your early influences uh well i kind of started playing guitar when i was like 12 and i think right away i was like oh this is it this is it man and i was just non-stop and then i figured out that i could study that uh after high school and i was like oh like i can do this seriously and i kind of um, put all my eggs in that basket and uh, bird problems just kind of happened while that was also happening on my end in terms of the education side of it so we, the band kind of grew sonically while I was also developing my, um, like my more formal training, I guess. Wow. And um, so Michael, you're, you're a guitarist as well, uh, but you're taking over the role as vocals in the band. What's your background as far as musical interests go? Yeah, so so musically, I started off kind of just uh, just playing guitar. I had lessons. I was learning kind of like blues stuff, and wasn't really necessarily connecting with it that much. I wasn't really practicing enough. Um, but once I got my electric, that's when Daniel and I were jamming on the stuff we used to play. So like we would jam like "Killing in the Name" and all that sort of stuff. A lot of "A Day to Remember," like he mentioned. Uh, so originally, I, I was writing the songs, uh, and and I only started doing vocals really because Daniel and I were kind of jamming in this community center. Uh, and there was just a mic there and we were playing these songs and I was like, all right, I'll, I'll go for it. So I started doing that. And uh, once we started playing shows, I, originally I would play kind of rhythm guitar, but Joseph very quickly uh, got way better than me and started playing stuff that was way too hard for me. And, and I also very quickly realized that as a performer, 
I really liked to run around and, and be a general maniac. Uh, and, and I couldn't really do that effectively with a guitar on me. So, you know, it started off like, oh, I'll take the guitar off for this song for a few songs. And then after probably a year or even less, I was like, all right, Joseph has clearly got this. Uh, I want to run around. So I just kind of dropped it. I, I still play a little bit of acoustic stuff and do some singer songwriter type stuff on the side a little bit. Yeah, when, when's the EP coming, Michael? <laughs> Soon. <laughs> so bird problems. Where does this name come from? What is this bird thing theme that seems to be going throughout your music? All right. Ooh. Well, you know we're that gonna, is a we're loaded question. Ooh, is it? The the bird theme. Just sort of, we built it, we've all sort of had our own encounters with birds. And I think bird problems mean something different to every one of us and probably to any one of our listeners. I feel like many people have approached us with their own theories about what it could mean. In terms of imagery, there's so many types of birds. There's so many things you can do. It's like endless pun opportunities. For me, at least, I, I just am not willing to let go of that that image. It's just too easy to keep kind of making stuff related back to it. And like the you know birds have problems, but bird problems could mean all sorts of different things. Yeah, you know, but birds. That's birds a nothing also give answer. Up. That's a nothing answer. <laughs> That's a nothing answer. <laughs> birds, birds also give us a lot of problems. You know, uh, I think we've all had we've all had problems with birds in our day. I remember being fairly young at a, a mini golf course up north, um, and our our phone was attacked by a bird in front of me. Um, these things happen, you know, and, and, and I always, you always hear, you know, whether birds are, are, you know, taking, taking craps on your parked car or whether they're, uh, you know, waking you up too early in the morning, like they're, you know, these bird problems kind of surround us. And, uh, yeah, we were, we were spitballing names for a little bit and, and it, it really, really stuck and can't imagine us having another name at this point. I think it's a really creative way of like throwing something into people's imaginations where you don't know what it is, but it could be so many different things. And like you said, you have fans telling you what their take on it is and what it means, but it's just limitless art uh, potentials, right? Absolutely. I mean, I, we've heard, uh, you know, from fans in the, in, in the UK and stuff that they call uh, women birds and, you know, that, that, could be, you know <laughs> that you have women problems, you have, you have girl problems. So yeah, you, you can get all your different interpretations in there, and and like Michael was saying, you know, the, the imagery is is just fantastic. You know, you you want to be able to brand and and have uh, sort of cool art to go with your stuff, and and I find that our, our art is always uh, is always fairly interesting, and we ha we have endless you know ideas for our art because of the name. It's just too easy. <laughs> so uh, at the beginning, do you guys remember what kind of if you guys had some sort of like vision between the three of you of like what you wanted to create and is that sort of what you created or does it, has it sort of surprised you what you've actually made over the years? Oh, it's, uh, it's Oh, Joseph, go ahead. I feel like, uh, at in the, well, the beginning is in 2013. So we definitely, I don't think we had a very clear vision back then. I think it was more of a for fun thing where we were just all committed to, playing a lot together weekly and practicing and writing stuff and jamming. But as we started um, figuring out that people liked what we were doing and we got more serious, played more shows, wrote more music, I think the vision shifted slightly to see how far we could take this. Maybe around uh, a couple years ago, maybe a couple, a year, two and a half years ago or something to, um, uh, to maybe see how far we could take this musically, like in terms of like, you know, the progressive aspect of the music, but also like the lyrical aspect of the music. I'm sure Michael had like a lot of stuff he wanted to do that he did with the lyrics and the concepts that he used. Yeah. The, um, I mean, our first album, I mean, before our first album, Tar, uh, the earlier stuff was like metalcore pop punk almost at points. Um, I always sort of wanted to do like a post hardcore type thing. Daniel and I have sort of similar, we, we all listen to fairly similar stuff. Uh, definitely tar was kind of something that uh, at least lyrically 
had been building up for years and years. Like there was, I had been writing this story. It comes with a, there's an accompanying novella that I wrote, which I had been working on for like five years before that even came out. So that sort of felt like something that we had to get out. And then after that, it, it felt like we had more freedom. And, and I definitely think with Beyond the Nest, we we zeroed in on more of a sound. And I feel like moving forward, that's something that we can kind of relate to a bit more. Before that, it, it does, looking back, it feels more like we were kind of exploring uh, it, it was clearly kind of coming from different influences than it is now. Yeah, I'll just add on like you, you kind of always think you're at your sound, and then you keep, you know, experimenting, and you 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 listen to new a lot of new music, and you get you know better as an individual player. In in my case, in Joseph's case, I would say, and you start to you know push yourself and push the group to develop a sound. So in terms in terms of sound, at least it, it's it's exceeded what, what I expected uh, by miles and miles because we went into it, you know, thinking that writing the sickest breakdown of, you know, 2012 was the, was the ultimate goal, you know what I mean? But it, it ended up kind of, you know, now looking back, like, like Michael and Joseph were saying, you, it, it almost, it feels um, weird to listen to old, old stuff. And it feels like it's not even the same, the same band. And, and, and fans have told us that too. And people who listen have told us that too, that, that the development is so clear from project to project is kind of um, exponential. Um, and that's just because we were still evolving as a band and as, and as individual players for many years while, while still, you know, being under that same name, under that same band. So it's kind of cool to see. I mean, there, there is definitely a clear, sort of progression and uh, evolution if you go through our discography from from then to now so definitely when you listen to tar and when you listen to beyond the nest it's like a clear evolution of you guys just finding more of basically your own signature style which is how it, uh, what i like because it's not like you're trying to copy anything when you went into uh write the material for beyond the nest were there any like key influences like playing in your guys's mind or concepts there was something that you kind of wanted to accomplish with that album there's there's a lot of uh i'd say what what we're listening to that comes through in what we what we write um you know bands like the contortionist uh, tesseract like just huge influences um that sort of drive your writing whether it's conscious or not um but the the I don't know if there was a super clear idea going in. I know that so Joseph and I usually just start the the writing process uh, us two kind of just riffing and and meshing riffs together, finding you know scrapping let's say you know nine out of ten riffs and then taking that one that that kind of hits different and it's really cool and, and expanding on it. And we go in fairly unorganized and just kind of really spitballing bouncing ideas off of each other and just a lot of songs were were sort of written over over uh, i guess a year span and then we just kind of narrowed down to the best stuff so so and this is the first time we we really did that that we, that we had a lot of music that you know could have been released but decided almost not to just for the sake of putting out only the best and and only what we were the happiest with and only even taking ideas to the next level that we were the happiest with um yeah, I don't know if you guys want to expand on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll say I'll just say on my end, it's a little bit different. Um, just because I, I remember very vividly uh, towards the end of Tar, I, I was so tired of the the concept because I've been working on it for so long, and it felt sort of very serious. And, and I'd really, really been longing to do something less serious. the The working title for our next release after Tar um, was a complete farce. Like that's what I was calling it, and what I was pitching to the guys. So I just wanted to do this really silly, like crazy, indulgent thing. Uh, and we released The Harpist and that was sort of the seed of that idea of like the music is indulgent. It's crazy. It's trying to sort of be all over. And, and lyrically, I wanted to tap into that as well and be a bit more indulgent lyrically. So a bit more silly. Uh, Beyond the Nest has a lot more of kind of bird puns and stuff than Tar. And, and I just wanted to still try to you know write something meaningful that can be interpreted uh, but that also had a bit more levity to it and, and sort of captured some of that less serious tone of the band itself 
Yeah, and and if we uh, take it back to the music aspect, I mean, sorry, the instrumental aspect of of the <laughs> singing isn't music. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, the instrumental aspect of the the writing process. I think since the harpist, I was on this um, hunt for the prog, and um, the harpist was kind of a happy accident. Like I just kind of put stuff together, and it, it ended up into a good song, but that doesn't always happen. Um, so when we were writing Beyond the Nest, there was just an abundance of ideas that were uh, not good. So there was a lot of rearranging and and uh, rewriting of different parts because I was trying to do this prog thing, but I, I was also trying to arrange stuff so that it makes sense in terms of what the song is and not just like technical riff salad for the sake of it, even though there's a lot of that as well. But uh, compared to to Tar, which is like a much more uh, jammed through writing process we, where we would uh, play stuff in real life and figuring out later, uh, Beyond the Nest was kind of like heavily arranged in on the computer, which is probably the biggest difference uh, in terms of our sound. Yeah, the writing process kind of flipped on its head um, from Tar to Beyond the Nest. Uh... And like Michael mentioned, the harpist was kind of a middle ground for that. But uh, Beyond the Nest was, yeah, we, Joseph and I heavily demoed uh, these tracks, um, you know, in Logic with uh, Get Good Drums. Like, like, let's get our sound immediately onto, from our brains onto this computer that's in front of us and then hear it back right away, uh, arrange it right away with all the, you know, tools that this program can give us. And uh, that allows for just better arrangement better um songs like uh, you know much much more um you have a lot more time and a lot more uh just ability through that program to to put your your ideas onto a screen in front of you and immediately hear what you are hearing in your head you know you know absolutely uh one thing i <laughs> really notice about you guys is your music videos i mean w do you guys do them mostly yourselves or what it was going on with like they're so good they they fit the music so well and it just also feels like it it was shot from your guys's own imagination so is this are you guys largely involved in how those look and how they all go together or uh some somewhat in terms of like uh, directing I think so uh, but uh, we haven't had um, a literal hands-on approach in terms of the the, um, the editing and like post uh, production work yet although that might happen with some future work I think because because I'm I'm getting quite into the video work right now so I think I might try to do something more DIY than I mean you know it's all been DIY but I mean more uh, in-house in, in terms of ideas, it's it's definitely all us. You know, we're we're um, Michael's a great writer, as as you know from the lyrics, and and we're all pretty creative dudes. Uh, you know, and when it comes to putting a visual to these songs that are pretty all over the place uh, musically, um, you know, definitely work heavily through uh, through Michael because he's the one that's coming up with the lyrics and ideas. So we want to make sure that the that the videos parallel that nicely. Um, but we're also, you know, for for the two videos that we dropped for Beyond the Nest, uh, for Pigeon and Qualia, we had my my childhood friend uh, Josh Kirshner uh, shoot those for us, and he's got a a very, you know, good understanding of 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 what we want. Um, he knew the songs very well, and you know, he's been around us and and is a good friend of ours and has been for a very long time. So it helped to have people close to you uh, shooting these videos as opposed to just bringing in you know, a random professional you don't really know and then telling them this crazy weird idea that you have and having them be uncomfortable and mad at you. <laughs> right. You mean like for the first two? Uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, um, no, but definitely uh, I, I do appreciate these guys because often I'll, I'll kind of write the script for the video and it'll be way too off the wall and just complete nonsense that just could never happen. And, and usually we'll have to find that happy medium. Um, but definitely, yeah, definitely we've written all of it, produced it all. Um, and it's usually fairly DIY. We usually, 
you know, see what kind of abandoned space we could find and, and quickly shoot in. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the the funny thing for for Pigeon too is I uh, I think it's our best video and it's literally like the prototype of what all of our 14 year old metalcore selves wanted to do like just shoot in an abandoned building and like have these like dark you know artsy shots and just all of us going hard and it's also the most like normal and serious video we've ever done even on set on the day like i remember so many times us being like yo should we do this weird thing and then it's like no no like, we're trying to we're trying to be a little serious here like let's let's just shoot us playing the, the damn song for once you know we get carried away pretty easily <laughs> Well, I guess I'm I'm kind of one of those more off the wall weirdos too, because my favorite video that you guys did it might sound weird is Qualia. It's, it's so artistic uh, the way you approach it, and I was really interested in that one long shot that you yeah. did. Was that really hard to film, and what made you guys decide to do that? Uh, so the story is we rented a bunch of uh, gear to film the pigeon video. And we had all these lights and we had these cameras rented and we had all of our time. So we just all took off that weekend, you know? So we had a Saturday, Sunday, we had two days to film in this abandoned place in case we needed it. And then we got there on the Saturday, we filmed the pigeon video and it was kind of uh, a hellish day of just, it was like November. We were in this like abandoned basement that was essentially a dungeon and we all wanted to go home really badly. So we filmed it all in that day. And then we had all our gear for the Sunday as well. And we kind of, uh, we all met up at Joseph's place after the pigeon shoot. And we were like, all right, what are we doing tomorrow? We should, we should shoot something else. We didn't even know if it was going to be a music video, a playthrough, uh, whatever. And then we were all just so like delirious from that day um, that we, st we started bouncing these ideas off of each other. Um, and it kind of just got to this idea of, of, uh, this uncomfortable video, you know, and, and, and just having that, you know, ideas of one shots are, are always super fun. We, we had a minimal space. We, we were basically, we had a living room to shoot in. Right. So we had to, we had to think, okay, what can we do that involves us three and is at the same time, you know, visually appealing and, and sort of maybe weird. And the song is all about perception as well. I'll let Michael go into, into that side of it, but you know, we had, we, we had all this gear essentially, and we wanted to, to get an, another another video out of that weekend and that's kind of how how that happened yeah so um it, there were a lot of ideas that were floating around for a while and i do remember uh even around the tar era we always wanted to do a video that just seemed normal but had consistent blatant continuity errors like the glass of water would always be a different kind of um you know more full, half, more half empty, whatever you want to call it, or in a different place, or we'd be wearing like different hats or different clothes in every shot, which is, it's, was sort of an idea, but there wasn't really any meat to it. Uh, so we kind of wanted to pull from that. Uh, we were also definitely, Daniel and I, inspired by kind of some rap videos. I think a lot of rappers will sort of do like, they'll miss lines here and there, and it's kind of like a vibe uh, when they're kind of doing a, a playthrough or, or a video like that. Um, I definitely remember going uh, and seeing if I could find any like different colored um, cups or anything in, in Joseph's kitchen. I found like all those different colored teacups and I was like, oh man, like we're getting these. I laid them all out. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was good. I think we did the whole thing maybe eight times through, maybe closer to 10. And each time we did the whole thing in one shot and, you know, we tried to choreograph it a bit more. We said, okay, I do this line. We, we sort of worked through it each time. And the, the final one was maybe the, the third or fourth take for the yeah. bulk of it. And, and we also, um, we'd be talking behind camera the entire time. So it was like, if the second the shot would leave me, I'd be like, all right. And then like pan to Joseph and, and then like, I'm, I'm going to go around here and switch the cups. And like, we were, so we, we were able to talk over it, uh, which helped. We were organizing while we were shooting, uh, Josh, the dude who filmed it, hated us, though, because his arms were extremely tired. Uh, he was like, he didn't have a super helpful rig for his back or arms and was holding this heavy camera and trying to have it be steady. So he uh, he said he can't watch the video anymore because he it hurts his arms. <laughs> uh, so uh, what other hobbies are you guys into? Other things that, you know, other than music? Uh, well, I, I'm a massive gamer. I'm a, 
my day job is in game development. I'm a virtual reality game developer. Uh, so I spend a ton of my time uh, playing all sorts of video games, VR video games. It's like half research, half uh, obviously something I'm very into. Uh, so I do that a lot. And, and I read a ton and I, I definitely pull from a lot of the stuff that I read and, and a lot of just the artsy media I engage with and, and use that in my lyrics and stuff and, and try to bring, I generally try to bring all that stuff back to the band if I can. Uh, I'm, I do a little bit, well, my, my, my day job is I'm, I'm a cook. Um, I'm a, I work at a jerk chicken restaurant actually, uh, hence the name of that song, but <laughs> I wouldn't say that cooking is like a big hobby or something that I, that I love or want to do. Um, I'm a big, I, honestly, the first thing that came to my mind when you asked that question, I'm a big music consumer. So when I'm not playing or, or trying to make stuff, I, I love discovering music and, and listening to music. I'm always, I, I'm, I'm a big hip hop guy as well. I'm listening to a lot of rap and a lot of uh, different stuff in, in that area. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm always on these blogs and trying to find, you know, new bands that I, that I may have missed. And, you know, there's, there's so much goddamn music out there and it's, it's super fun to just, I, I die. I go into these rabbit holes and wake up like three hours later with like, you know, tons of stuff, too many tabs open and, <laughs> A lot of a lot of new bands uh, that I, that I'm into at that point, so I'd have to say that. Yeah, that that question is really hard for me because I I play a lot of guitar and I do a lot of writing and producing, and when I'm not doing that, I'm trying to not do anything, <laughs> so I could like do more things the next day. But I guess I consume a lot of uh, of like like films and series and stuff. Like I love I love the the technical aspect of how that stuff is made. And I'd love to do more video work as well, because I'm a huge nerd about that stuff. But in terms of um, hobbies, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard question for me right now. <laughs> we, we all watch a lot of anime too. Oh yeah, okay, that's my answer. I changed my answer. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, what is it about Montreal and progressive music? Why is there so many prog guys in Montreal and Toronto? I'd say it's mostly Toronto. <laughs> uh, not to throw shade at my own city, but not a ton of uh, it, it, comparatively. You know, we, we we go to Toronto and the prog bands there are just incredible, like blow us away. Uh, we play a lot of shows with um, Bastilla, uh, Telomere, uh, Parliament Owls. These guys, they're not, you know, not huge bands like local Toronto bands, but they are incredible like the the talent in toronto is is crazy and there's a scene for it montreal uh there's good good stuff for sure but it's we, you know if we're put on bills if we're playing locally we're playing here uh you're gonna see a lot more discrepancy uh, between the bands uh, than you would in toronto in toronto you're gonna get consistently like four or five prog bands on a bill here it'll it's it's a booming uh, metalcore hardcore scene in montreal so we kind of get roped in with bands like that which is no problem but uh for, for if you're looking for prog prog uh, toronto's crazy for that yeah it's nuts I, 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 going around on band camp or whatever is just like one after another after another holy holy how can there be so many bands in one city <laughs> it's a huge city <laughs> yeah blows my mind you gotta Is shout it... out oh sorry go ahead. no no just say what are you gonna say? Uh, I was gonna say no i was gonna say we gotta uh, mention red-handed denial as well they're very toronto sort of proggy bands that uh we played with when they were in montreal and they're sort of we've played a lot with them since then every time they're in montreal every time we're in toronto and definitely like daniel was saying i, I think the first like full-on actual prog show we did was in toronto in montreal we were sort of on the extremes playing with like pop punk or death metal bands, uh, especially in the earlier years. Okay. But Toronto, Toronto also is very good at, uh, at sort of hyping up these events and promoting, um, you, you know, there, there's certain venues that people are kind of at anyways in Toronto. I find like, like people just will wander into a metal venue and just go to a show. And I think that happens a lot less uh, in in Montreal or or anywhere else. That that you just wander, you'd hear like a band playing from the street and just like go and pay covers, see them. Uh, I feel like that's something that's 
way more you know part of the music culture over there in Toronto they're also supportive of each other as well like the scene the prog scene they were they're like right when we started before we even went to Toronto we sort of had a following there and then when you go down there it's it, it was crazy they had like prog meetups just randomly at bars and stuff like they, they're all very sort of into the genre and, and, and into you know helping it uh, strive Wow. Well, uh, guys, over a half an hour now, this is the longest interview I've ever done. Uh, where, where's the best way for anybody to follow up on what you guys are doing and just check where you are on Facebook or on your website? I'd say Instagram is the one I, I we use the most to promote stuff. Facebook's great too. Um, yeah, Instagram, Facebook is, is really the way to go. And, and we have our website up too, uh, birdproblems.ca, which is a nice little domain that we have. Um, but yeah, I, I'd say Insta, if if you need one, Instagram's the way to go. Yeah, and for for listening, I mean everything's everything everything's on Bandcamp, uh, as well as all the streaming services, uh, Spotify, and all that. Perfect. Is there anything else that you guys wanted to let the listeners know? Real quick, uh, it's Michael's birthday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, happy birthday, Michael! Awesome. Uh, and I love you. And, uh, and many more. Aww. Many more. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah, well, thank you so much for taking time. Uh, you've been listening to The Peach Pit. I was taking time to talk to Bird Problems this week. And thank you so much, you guys, for taking time to talk to me. Pleasure. Thank you for having us, man. For sure. Thanks for having us. Awesome. Well, take care of yourselves, okay? Happy to. You too. See ya.